On the morning of Tuesday, August 28, 1934, Idaho Department of Fish and Game Deputy Warden Ellsworth Arthur Teed left his mole in Idaho home. He set out telling his wife Alma Teed he was headed to investigate reports of out-of-season poached deer in the Boulder Gulch area, but indicated he'd return that afternoon for a funeral in town. When he failed to return, she notified friends and family, as well as local authorities. His car would be found at the base of Boulder Gulch next to the Mullen Cemetery. The preceding 10 days would see the largest ever search effort in Shoshone County history, bringing resources from three states, planes, bloodhounds, and thousands of search hours, but ultimately would return very little evidence, frustrating family and law enforcement alike, leaving the plain question, what happened to Deputy Game Warden Ellsworth Arthur Teed? Mullen is the easternmost town in Shoshone County and the Silver Valley, a region named for its rich mining prospects, and Mullen is no different. At this time, the largest operation in Mullen was the Morning Mine, a successful lead and silver mine that drew able-bodied men from across the region to seek an honest wage for hard work. Ellsworth would find himself moving his young family north from his childhood home in Clearwater County to Mullen, seeking work at the Morning Mine. As the years would pass, he would become well acquainted with the vast wilderness in the surrounding area. Friends and family considered him an astute outdoorsman, and he soon found an opportunity in a somewhat new profession as a deputy game warden. Idaho Department of Fish and Game was established in 1899, however initially they could not secure a game warden for Shoshone County. This type of enforcement was a new thing for the western states and wasn't always met with enthusiasm. The position saw him overseeing the wildlife management in the area, leaving him to ensure state hunting and fishing regulations were being enforced. This largely meant targeting out-of-season harvest of game animals, and unfortunately, on the heels of the Great Depression, just 50 years removed from the buffalo hunting expeditions, this is not an uncommon occurrence. As an avid sportsman himself, Ellsworth took this position very seriously, and by all accounts, he was a very effective game warden. He was popular with locals, and in turn, they were helpful to him, often providing tips about possible poaching. On this particular occasion, Deputy Teed had received a tip about possible deer poaching south of Mullen in an area known as Boulder Gulch. Not a remote area by any means, and being a hot, smoky August day, he sets out in light clothing. He parks his car at the base of the gulch next to the town cemetery, leaving his lunch and coat in the passenger seat. From the moment he steps out of that vehicle, we can only speculate about what happened to him. Knowing that her husband was very particular about notifying her of his intentions, she was extremely concerned when he did not return by early afternoon, as he had indicated. By early evening, Alma went to the local police with fears he'd either been hurt in an accident or been met with violence while investigating. Authorities immediately located his locked vehicle, with his lunch and coat still in plain view inside. No sign of him could be found in the immediate vicinity, and feeling darkness would make searching nearly impossible. The investigating sheriff's deputies opted instead to muster volunteers and mount a posse for first light. Hopes are initially high. The area is very rugged and getting injured from a trip or a fall beyond being able to walk yourself out is not at all unheard of. The August heat and smoke from a nearby large forest fire kept the days sweltering, but in the night times the mountains can see anywhere from a 40 to 60 degree temperature drop. A sheriff's posse consists of about 50 officers and volunteers from the area. They begin the work of looking for evidence for where Teed was headed from his vehicle. Searchers fan out through the gulch, but dread builds as the hours begin to add up without so much as a shred of evidence. Knowing they're in a race against the clock if there is any hope to find Teed alive, as the first day of searching comes to a close, Shoshone County Sheriff Fred May calls in further resources from nearby towns as well as from the state offices in Boise. Nothing happens quickly, and every minute drags on for Deputy Teed's wife and two sons, praying for his safe return. The next morning saw the arrival of more than 200 searchers, as well as more advanced search equipment. Lloyd Donaldson, a local pilot from Kellogg, volunteered to fly his plane with the District Forest Ranger E.F. Helmers in the passenger seat to do an aerial search for any possible sign of Teed. As well on the ground, Ed Kingman has arrived from the Walla Walla, Washington Penitentiary with two well-trained tracking bloodhounds to assist in running down the missing deputy. Reports are provided from nearby residents of possible gunshots somewhere in the gulch late the night prior. 
Although the shots couldn't be pinpointed, they gave many hope that this was an attempted distress signal from a wounded Deputy Teed. The aerial search is short-lived, lasting only a few short hours due to low visibility from the continually raging forest fire on the St. Joe River before they have to land for the day. The Bloodhounds set out with ten officers and guides in tow and quickly picked up a hot trail. The moving is arduous, but by 4.30 they have reached the second ridge beyond Boulder Gulch, where they seem to lose the scent in an open field. The dogs nosed around for a while, while the officers searched for any discernible clues in the area, but none could be identified. Whatever trail the dogs were following had gone cold, and the search team was left exhausted and empty-handed, making it back to town at 9 p.m. just after dark, having covered seven mountainous miles. By the 31st of August, 1934, Deputy Game Warden Teed had been missing for three days, and desperation was beginning to set in for the searchers. Sixty young men from a nearby youth civilian conservation corps camp joined the search. The total team had grown to nearly 250, including Teed's own sons and brother. As soon as it's light enough to discern objects on the forest floor, they fan out, walking 15 feet apart, covering the forest like a grid. A separate team of 12 heads out from the opposite side of the mountain, searching up Placer Creek in case he had crossed over in pursuit of poachers. Searchers in Boulder Canyon find clear evidence of poaching, with three recent deer carcasses found in shallow graves nearby some large feather piles consistent with poached game birds. The bloodhounds leave headed back to Walla Walla midday, with Kingman stating that Teed's trail had gone cold and it was too windy and dusty for his dogs to keep the trail. The next morning is a Sunday, and with most everyone in town having the day off, the mountains are flooded with concerned citizens. More than 500 searchers and volunteers took to the mountains with the state search plane whirring overhead. Long abandoned prospectors' holes are probed due to the rumored possibility that Teed's remains had been tossed down an old mine shaft. The aerial search once again is called off due to poor visibility from excessive smoke. The bloodhounds, however, are brought back in from Walla Walla at the insistence of Mrs. Teed. They pick up a new trail and run it down for over a mile, but ultimately lose the trail in an area where the dust was ankle deep. A group of searchers working the trail to the old Idaho Giant Mine find several spent shotgun shells and a handkerchief bearing the initial E. Although neither could be definitively tied to Deputy Game Warden Teed, doubt he'd ever be found becomes widespread amongst the searchers. By the end of day Monday, both officers and posse men alike are feeling defeated and hopeless in their efforts. Neither evidence of an accident or foul play can be identified, and rumors begin to draw attention away from Boulder Gulch. State Game Warden Eckert and Sheriff May refuse to give up and enlist the Mineral County Montana Sheriff and St. Regis Montana Game Warden's assistance in searching the westernmost territory of Montana in case Teed had crossed state lines following the people he was investigating. Shoshone deputies follow rumors about possible resting places, but end up on a goose chase never finding any credible evidence of his whereabouts. Local sportsmen are the first to put up a monetary reward, with the Shoshone County Sportsmen's Association offering a cash payout of $100 for information. President Ingersoll states, The sportsmen of the district are very much concerned. Indeed, we had an efficient and aggressive game officer who went about his duties in a thorough manner. If he's been killed in the line of duty by game violators, it is time such criminals are brought to justice, and we propose to use every effort to solve the mystery of his disappearance. If we find his body and it is shown to be met with foul play, the sportsman will give every aid to the state and county officials running down his slayers. Searches began to lag with only a few volunteers and groups of young men from the CCC still searching the mountains, while law enforcement turned to investigations. An initial investigation by the Wallace and Kellogg police found that Teed had no known enemies or disputes and expressed their opinion that he had likely injured himself and was unable to attract help. Reports of a man resembling Teed in Paradise, Montana lead Shoshone County deputies to investigate, but ultimately the man is discovered to be a hitchhiker with no knowledge of the case. As it appears the case is stalling, Teed's sister from Kamloops, British Columbia posts an additional $300 reward good for 30 days for information for her brother's whereabouts. On September 25th, State Game Warden Eckert and North Idaho Game Warden Quarles return to Shoshone County and make an announcement touting hot new clues. They claim their determination to solve the mystery, stating it is the game department's intention to carry on the search for Teed until we find him or until we are completely satisfied he will never be found. 
The next day, the Idaho Mutual Benefit Association posts an additional $25 reward for information revealing that Deputy Teed had taken out a policy worth $3,000 just two weeks before his disappearance. At this point, the case all but halts. No trace can be found of the missing warden, and investigators' best efforts were fruitless, facing mounting public scrutiny and pressure from Teed's family. It would be four long months of silent investigation before any sort of break would occur. An anonymous Spokane man contacted the sheriff, claiming he knew what had happened to the missing deputy. Sheriff May sat down with Eckert, the state game warden, and Quarles, the North Idaho game warden, along with the anonymous man. The informant had previously worked with Teed at the Morning Mine in Mullen, and claimed that he had seen Teed on the road from Republic, Washington, headed toward Canada on September 15th or 16th, a full two weeks after he'd gone missing. He had not given law enforcement this information before because he thought Teed would be arrested if he was found and did not want to be seen as a squealer. Whatever causes change of heart is unclear. The sheriff and game wardens found his story to be substantially correct and they believe Teed was alive and well somewhere in Canada. It is unclear what evidence they actually had of this, however the sheriff announced they'd be reopening the search for the deputy centered around this new information. From here, no new information would be made publicly available in whatever continuing investigations into Deputy Teed's fate existed. After seven years, on January 7, 1942, Alma Teed would file suit against the Idaho Mutual Benefit Association, seeking the payout from Ellsworth's $3,000 policy. And as far as legal proceedings go, this was quickly granted a month later, on February 6, 1942, when a state district court would declare Ellsworth Arthur Teed deceased. While we may have reached a legal conclusion, we've answered almost no questions. Did Deputy T die the day that he set out to investigate Boulder Gulch? Was he met with foul play at the hands of nefarious characters, or was he the victim to Idaho Wilderness's unforgiving nature? Did he manage to avoid detection and assume an identity in Canada? And if that is the case, why? With so little to go on, all anyone can really do is speculate, but I've got the time, so let's explore some possibilities. Theory 1. Deputy Teed fled to Canada. This seems to be the theory that the local law enforcement leadership ultimately adopted as their most likely outcome, with some accepting it entirely. But I'd raise a few questions in response. In the investigation that followed his disappearance, there were no indications that Teed had any enemies or any particular debts. He was a well-respected and highly regarded member of his community. His friends and family members recounted him as a devoted husband and father to two sons. While the logistics escaping your current identity and starting anew in Canada were certainly possible at the time, I struggle to find a motive. While it is true T did take out a life insurance policy a mere two weeks before his disappearance, that $3,000 only inflates to around $67,000 in today's money. Not nothing, but certainly not worth losing their father. The gentleman that came forward to claim that he'd seen Teed headed to Republic Washington was never publicly identified, making it all but impossible for anyone other than the sheriff and game wardens whom he met with to question his account of events. Once these allegations were laid, it seems like the investigation mostly ceased. Obviously, searching for a man possibly hiding somewhere in the country of Canada would be jurisdictionally impossible for Idaho state and county authorities, but it'd be a long shot even for Canadian authorities. He would have been leaving an established, respected life and family for a place where he seemed to have no ties, risking serious criminal charges in the process. T did have a sister in Kamloops, British Columbia, that'd be a 230-mile walk north of Republic Washington. However, the same sister posted a $300 reward for information on her brother's whereabouts. That's about $6,500 today. While the reward ultimately went unclaimed, it seems unlikely she would have posted it if she had any inclination he had left of his own volition. While this theory is plausible, it is the one I find the least likely to have befallen Deputy Teed. Theory 2. Deputy Teed met a natural death while investigating Boulder Gulch. Let me be the first to tell you, this is an unforgiving landscape in general. Everything from the wildlife to the mountainsides are equal parts beauty and potential danger. In many cases, the search area is so vague or large that this begins to seem like a much more likely scenario than not. North Idaho's vast mountainous wilderness is, well, mountainous and wild. More than a few souls have been lost to a misplaced step, a poorly timed tree fall, or a rock slide, or any number of hungry predators. But in this case, we have a fairly specific target search area, Boulder Gulch. Deputy T told his wife he'd be in the area, 
and his vehicle being found at the base of the gulch pretty well solidifies that he at least began there. This is a steep gulch, but not one that has a particularly large number of cliffs or areas that one might find themselves taking a large fall. And while the gulch itself is undeniably large for a single man, this was the largest search in county history, with some claims reaching up to a peak of a thousand searchers over a 10-day search. The area now is particularly dense with forest vegetation, but fires and timber harvest practices in the early 20th century had far less greenery left on the hills. This would also leave far fewer places that the body might be obscured. The aerial search was often obfuscated by smoke from the nearby St. Joe fire, but ground searchers combed and recombed the entirety of the gulch for 10 days, at times aided by bloodhounds. In the 88 years since, the gulch has remained public land, with portions being managed by the Bureau of Land Management. There are several trails through the gulch that see both hiker and off-road bike use, as well as being frequented by hunters and outdoor explorers alike. This gulch is directly south of the town of Mullen, within easy walking distance with several neighborhoods nearby. While I am a firm believer that it is relatively easy to get lost forever in the woods, I do not believe that was the case here. Teed, by all accounts, was an avid outdoorsman who was well acquainted with the local mountains. Had he been investigating the gulch, I don't believe he likely would have left it. His intentions to be back by afternoon, coupled by the location he was parked in, would have made it difficult to get past the gulch in time. As well, this isn't an area I'd assume somebody would get lost in, especially someone like Teed. The shape and structure of the gulch make it easy to tell what direction the town is in, even if you couldn't clearly see it from whatever vantage point you had. Aside from falling into a prospector's hole or being stashed by a predator, it'd be hard to meet a natural death with such little of a trace in so small of a search area. Had Teed met an environment caused death, I would be inclined to believe that he would have been found by the enormous search in the 10 days after his disappearance. Theory 3. Deputy Teed met with poachers in Boulder Gulch that ultimately took his life. This theory, while being the darkest and most disheartening, I find the most credible. During the search, evidence of poaching was found in the form of three shallow graves with deer carcasses definitely killed out of season, and several piles of game bird feathers. Poaching was definitively happening in Boulder Gulch. Poverty-induced hunger during the Great Depression led to a spike in poaching in the early 1930s, coupled with governmental disdain in the region and a populace not accustomed to hunting and fishing regulations. Deputy Teed would have had his hands full. Being the only game warden in the county would have given him a good helping of infamy among local poachers and put a target on his back. At least one news source I've found stated that Teed was specifically going to investigate the three deer carcasses, but does not state how he knew of their existence. Often tips would come from other county residents. Is it possible that someone tipped him off with the intention of ambushing him when he went to investigate? Could he have happened upon a poacher in the act who would then get the better of him? A quick glance into our not-so-distant past can return many such instances. Warden Justin Hurst is killed after a man spotted illegally hunting leads them on a 50-minute chase ending in a shootout. Wildlife Conservation Officer David Grove is killed by a man he'd pulled over to investigate for spotlighting deer. Idaho Department of Fish and Game Wardens William Pogue and Conley Elms are wounded and then executed while investigating a poacher's camp. This is a dangerous job, far from backup, where you can be nearly guaranteed everyone you talk to is armed, and not all of them legally so. By all accounts, Teed was a no-nonsense lawman, and it's my belief that he may have been met with malice while performing his duties, and his body was either removed and hidden outside the gulch or concealed in an old mine working within the area. In the years that followed his death, Deputy Teed's memory sadly faded. In an area rich with history, somehow this gentleman's mysterious disappearance would be a forgotten item. The largest search the county had ever seen would be followed by more than 80 years of radio silence. In January 2023, efforts by Idaho cold cases in conjunction with surviving descendants of Teed and the Idaho Department of Fish and Game led to Teed's long-deserved recognition on the National Law Enforcement Memorial recognizing his sacrifice in the line of duty. As of the beginning of 2023, Ellsworth Arthur Teed has not been found. Although he's been declared deceased, the declaration still leaves a question mark where our brains would like to see a period, a tantalizing, unanswered question held out with no foreseeable way to seek the answer. What happened to Deputy Game Warden Ellsworth Arthur Teed?